Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 10th lecture in our series about Laconian Messenia through the ages. Now, before uh, I introduce this evening's speaker, there's a little bit of housekeeping to go through. Um, you will see on your uh, screens for people who are watching this online that you'll have one speech bubble, which is the chat in which you can put comments and uh, communicate with each other during the lecture. And then there are two speech bubbles with the queue, and those are the questions. And only the speaker and myself can see the questions. And please don't type questions into the chat section. And I think that's basically all the, um, all the housekeeping. Uh, I'll repeat that at the end uh, when we're collecting up the questions. Now, it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome this evening's speaker, as he and I were contemporary students at the British School and we became friends. And during that time, a small group of us made a short trip to Methana on the coast of the Peloponnese, where Graham and I both pure text people then were introduced to the amazing world of pottery and to the unbelievable concept that it was actually just lying around on the ground. And Graham read Mauds and Greats at Oxford before embarking on his doctoral studies and becoming a student at the school, his base while researching history and archaeology of the island of Samos. And he went on to take up research fellowships in both Oxford and Cambridge, not, not simultaneously. For more than 20 years, he's been professor of ancient history at Leicester University. And he's been a visiting fellow at the BSA. And in 2020, he was awarded a DLIT by the University of Oxford. Now, Graham's research has focused on Greece from the classical to Roman periods especially through regional histories such as those of Samos, Laconia, and the wider Peloponnese, which resulted in his books, A History of Samos, The Early Hellenistic Peloponnese, and The Greek World After Alexander. And he's also interested in Greek geographical writings and has published an edition of Scylax's Periclus, The Circumnavigation of the Inhabited World. Now, for many years, Graham and I took part in the fieldwork of the Laconia survey, when 75 square kilometres of land in the foothills of Mount Parnon were traversed systematically. Many previously unknown archaeological sites were found and recorded. And we both also contributed to the publication of the survey results and their interpretation. So I'm especially happy that he agreed to speak to us this evening on the subject, space and place in classical and early Hellenistic Messenia. Is that okay? It's okay for me. Is it okay for others? Yeah. Okay. Shall I start? Easy, so. Well, thank you, Pam, for that marvellous and uh, moving introduction, full of happy reminiscences. Uh, I don't often think about the Methanet trip, but it really was a formative experience in this kind of weather, actually. January it was, and very sunny and very cold at night indeed. And uh, that was one of my first closest encounters, I think, with um, Peloponnesian landscapes, um, with you and Richard Captain and Tom Galant, I believe. Yes. Possibly Alan Harvey as well. Yes. Now a distinguished Byzantinist. So these friendships are, well, anyone here who knows the BSA knows what friendships and legion of acquaintances you establish and they last a lifetime. So um, I'm slightly out of my real zone of expertise tonight. Uh, I have published uh, on Laconia extensively 
Lucumia survey and articles about the Spartan perioikoi. Um, I did the chapters in the Hanson Nielsen inventory of classical polis, city states, the chapters on Messinia and Lacedaemon, as they are entitled. Um, but since I wrote the Messenia chapter, which came out 18, 19 years ago, I hadn't thought about Messenia. So it's been um, quite an interesting few days thinking again and afresh about this region. Uh, and I hope to offer a, a few uh, rather amateurish uh, new perspectives from the point of view of someone who's just getting into that uh, research. So um, I sh I'm sticking to a script and if I stick to it fairly carefully, this probably will last about 40, 45 minutes. So I'll try not to improvise. So after some def defining of terms and names, I shall consider classical and early Hellenistic Messenia as a dynamic regional landscape with some thoughts on the distribution of settlements, specifically the dependent perioikic polis city-states of Sparta during the period of Spartan domination and their successors in the early era of Messenian independence. I shall consider in particular the nature of polis territories in relation to Helot settlement. Some of the magical terms I've just used will be explained in a moment. I shall consider some implications of settlement patterns for the history of this region after the foundation of its new central place, the city of Messene, down to about 200 BC. My pronunciation will vary. Sometimes I will say Messenia, Messenia or Messenia, the city, Messene or Messene, not to be confused with Mycenae, of course, in the North Peloponnese. In the last part of the talk, inspired by some ideas of the geographer Yi Fu Tuan, I shall pose questions about what kinds of meaning we should expect places in Messenia and the spaces between them to have accrued both during and after Spartan domination. Inevitably, I shall have more questions than answers, but perhaps some of the questions will be new or at least deserve an airing. Need to move to slide, but the arrow didn't take me there. Oh, I clicked in the right place, perhaps. Thank you. Here is the passage from the catalogue of ships in book two of Homer's Iliad about the region that stands between that headed by Lacedaemon, Sparta and the regions of Arcadia and Elis. Homer doesn't name Messene or Messenia. Of the nine place names, only two, Pylos and what he calls Kiparisseis, map easily onto classical geography. Note that the Helos mentioned in these lines is different from the Helos in Laconia, which uh, Homer has mentioned a few lines before, and like Messe and Oitilos in the Mani Peninsula, is included by Homer in the territory of Menelaus, which we call Laconia. Strabo and other geographers spilled much ink debating whether Nestor's kingdom was in western Messenia or beyond Messenia's northern border, as the reference in line 692 to the river Alpheos might be taken to imply. But uh, archaeologists from my recent readings seem now generally to have associated this passage with memories of the late Bronze Age state of Mycenaean Pylos in Western Messenia, where, just for interest and decoration, uh, a warrior grave of the late Bronze Age, excavated in 2015, has recently produced Minoan jewellery, uh, which is claimed to be of unmatched quality in the Bronze Age Aegean, and adds to the luster of what was evidently a kingly society memories of that then lying behind classical Messenia. The fertility of lowland Messenia between the two mountain ranges that you see on this map from the Barrington Atlas is emphasized repeatedly. Its heartland in antiquity was the inland plain of Steliklaros, labeled in red, which is assumed to have been the main farming area. The Western Hills, however, have been described as the best Farmling, farmland of among hill territories in the in the 
Peloponnese, on account of the predominance of softer rocks over the otherwise ubiquitous marble and limestone. Groundwater and streams are plentiful in this region, and the river Pamisos, marked in blue, uh, is the largest perennial river in the Peloponnese. What we now recognize as the central place in this region, Messini, was not founded until after the partial liberation of the region from Spartan control following a Theban invasion in 369 BC. Initially, the city was named Ithome after the lofty mountain beside which it lies with view sheds over the whole of central and southern Messenia. Other than the spectacular excavations at the polis of Messini, led by Professor Themelis for many years on behalf of the Archaeological Society of Athens, our knowledge of the archaeology of rural Messenia and of the smaller towns of the region is pretty fragmentary, complex and uncertain of interpretation. There are many things we don't understand. I've chosen these images uh, purely as illustrations of the beauty and sophistication of the architecture of the new regional capital, much of which, well, the fortifications are probably fourth century, mid fourth century indeed, um, the other buildings, uh, which are very fine, and the town plan were probably extended out during the third and later centuries. In the classical period, depending on where we think its boundaries lay at any given date, Messenia was rather smaller than what we call in English Laconia, uh, which was sometimes called Lacedaemon, which is the same name as was sometimes used for Sparta, the town, sometimes for the Eurotas Valley. Messenia appears to have occupied roughly 1,000 square miles, about 2,600 square kilometres, about one seventh larger than the English historic county of Leicestershire, where I now live. Anyone looking into Messenian settlement owes an immeasurable debt to the topographical work of scholars of the last two centuries, such as William Martin Leake in the early 19th century, Ernst Curtius, top right in the 1850s, Nathan Valmin, Swede, in the 1920s, Ernst Meyer, of whom I couldn't find a photo, in a long series of articles in Pauli's Encyclopedia, and of course the authors of the pioneering Minnesota Messenia expedition in the 1950s, published in 1972, uh, edited by Rapp and MacDonald, and the more recent surveys and excavations led by Jack Davis and Sharon Stocker. When analysing the political or civic landscapes of the classical period, it is important to cultivate what chess players call accurate play, particularly when trying to understand what I call vertical divisions. That is the way in which the inhabitants of a segment of the Earth's surface divide it up. Think of slicing a pizza with the cutter vertical and what they mean when they divide up their landscapes. The main regional identities of the Peloponnese were seen as worthy of investment of time and effort for more than a thousand years. Despite the vagueness of Homer about this region, Messenia became a recognized culture region like the others in the Peloponnese, and is the framework for Pausanias's fourth book written in the imperial period. We can understand Messenia best if we treat it as a region, but we must also see regions as internally dynamic and manipulable, not monolithic or static. Culture regions can be thought of as fields of care, in the words of the late Yi Fu Tuan, much admired professor of geography at Madison, Wisconsin, whose work has inspired many archaeological studies. I'll return later to some of his notions of meaning and space. Regional identities are bound to evolve as other frames of identity evolve. In order to get to grips with the internal dynamics of classical Messenia, ruled as it was by Sparta for 300 years, we need to get certain technicalities out of the way. Messini, sometimes written with one S or sigma in our sources, and names related to it, 
are perhaps cognate with the Greek adjective meaning middle, which suggests perhaps uh, that originally these names uh, expressed the inland nature of the core territory rather than the whole southwestern Peloponnese. Be that as it may, Messenia sometimes occurs as an adjective accompanying the word ge, land, but comes in not very long time to be a noun or name meaning either the territory of the new city or the region as a whole. Nino Luraghi, in his monumental study of Messenian identity, aptly suggests that there was a deliberate ambiguity in this usage. Given that the citizens of the new capital city, if that's how you like to see it, of the region, seem to have regarded themselves as the rightful leaders of the whole region, a theme to which I shall return later, they did encounter some resistance, it seems. As you all know, Messenia was governed by Sparta for several centuries. The Spartans were one group among the Lacedaemonians, Lacedaemonioi. The other Lacedaemonioi were the Perioikoi, or as I like to call them, the circumhabitants, the free citizens of the towns around Sparta, which were small city-states, polis, according to the Greek's notion of a city-state. This larger Lacedaemonian identity was, I think, at least as important to Spartans as was their Spartanness. The men we habitually call kings of Sparta were in fact kings of the Lacedaemonians. Treaties and alliances were made with the Lacedaemonians, not with the Spartans. The Perioikoi, the circumhabitants, were not allies of Sparta in the normal sense. Rather, with Sparta, they were party to such treaties and alliances. The Perioikoi did not pay tribute to Sparta. The feared Spartan army, as we often call it, was actually the Lacedaemonians of which the Perioikoi at times made up half. Thus, in accounts of wars and battles, historians like Xenophon clearly distinguish Spartan casualties from Perioikic. Laconia and Messenia were denoted jointly by the term <coughs> at the bottom left of the screen, Laconike, meaning the land of the Lacones, Lacon being a short form of Lacedaemonios. Laconike covered all places dominated by Sparta at a given date, Thus, down to 369, it, it covers nearly all of this map, and therefore it changed in extent over time. Like Laconia, the region we call Messenia contained perioikic polis, city-states of Lacedaemonians, who, we assume, played a key role in controlling the region's wider population and landscapes. Here's another example of accurate play, I hope. It's often said that Messenia was liberated in 369 BC from the Spartans after the Thebans defeated the Lacedaemonian army at Leuctra in Boeotia in 371. In fact, however, part of the region of Messenia remained under Spartan control until after the Battle of Chironea in 338, when Philip II of Macedonia defeated the Southern Greeks and went on to take away further territory from Sparta's control. The Author Pseudo Skylax, writing around the time of Chironea, but before Philip's intervention in Laconia, says that the coast of Messenia measures only 300 stades, which is less than 40 miles. And he puts the end of Messenia and the start of Lacedaemon at Mothone, which you can see at the southwestern point of the Peloponnese. What was liberated after Leuctra seems therefore to have been the agricultural heartland of Messenia, which became, one assumes, the polis territory of the new city of Ithome, soon to be renamed Messene, plus Kiparisia or Kiparisos in the northwest, and probably the rest of northern and western Messenia. What do I mean by polis territory? The Copenhagen Polis project, directed by Mons Hansen, showed that, with very few exceptions, Greek texts down to about 300 BC call a place a polis only if it has three, th three things. A town, a rural territory, or chora, and Greek-style politics. Likewise, the sources show that, first, polis, city-states, can form parts of larger states. Second, size is irrelevant. Polis can be very, very small in terms of either territory or population. Third, public buildings and fortifications are not necessary. And in particular, fourth, 
A polis does not need to be free to be called a polis. It may even be under the sway of a larger power. And thus is what we call a dependent polis, translating the Greek phrase hyperkoos polis. Dependent meaning, to make it simpler, not independent. And fifthly, the occurrence of a city surname or polis ethnic, ethnicon, is good evidence that a place was accepted as being a city state whose members could therefore be called politi citizens. The Lacedaemonian perioikoi, when they are away from their home regions, are identified in texts and inscriptions by their polis ethnic, not as Lacedaemonioi, but as, for example, as you see at the bottom left of the screen, uh, a Githiates, a citizen of the polis of Githion, Sparta's harbour town, or indeed a Spartiates, a citizen of Sparta itself. Lacedaemonios is the regional ethnic. Githiates and Spartiates, which I should have put on the screen, are city ethnics or polis ethnics. Thus, the Perioikoi were recognized as citizens of dependent polis, which had internal autonomy but were dominated by Sparta. We don't know how this dependency operated in detail but we must allow perioikic communities a degree of agency in their dealings with Sparta and other polis. This is important for an inquiry into meaningful landscapes in Messenia. Indeed, such as was the strength of polis identity there, that two perioikic polis, Thuria and the unlocated Aithaya, actually joined a rebellion against Spartan rule in the 460s. If a classical writer or an inscription calls a place a polis, it will have had a Greek style constitution of some kind and a specific rural territory or hora, separate from the territories of other polis. So on this basis, we can identify about 10 definite probable or possible perioikic polis before the foundation of the polis of Ithome Messene. Messenia is particularly abundant in unlocated place names some of which are likely to refer to periochic polis, whose location we do not know. In addition, several archaeological sites are not linked to any known place name and may also have been periochic polis. This would further increase the number of such polis and consequently reduce the size of the territory of each. It is often thought that Pausanias, in Book 4 of his Guide to Greece, written in the 2nd century AD, underrepresents the important settlements of Messenia. Traditionally, this has been thought to be because of a lack of substantial monuments, but rather, as Luragi argues, Pausanias devotes most of the book to legend and early Messenian history for a simple reason. He is aiming to fill a gap in the historical literature that had been written to that date. One might add that Pausanias probably encountered a lack of written histories of Messenia covering the archaic and classical periods. He had rich material of that kind for other regions, but those well, 300 years of those periods were of course the time when Sparta was in control of Messenia. And it may be that there was no, as it were, Messenian history being written by Messenians at that time, uh, and of course, notoriously, much of what was written uh, by Pausanias may depend on reconstructed history uh, from the time after liberation. Furthermore, we must recognize the overwhelming predominance of the city of Messene in the five centuries from its liberation down to Pausanias's day. Pausanias does, in fact, discuss as cities, all the places I've circled in yellow, uh, apart from Aulon in the northwest. Plus a few more, which we'll mention in a moment. Plus, he has already described Thalamai in the southeast and Cardamile nearby at the end of Book 3, as they had been reassigned to Laconia by Roman emperors. Not only may some of the cities Pausanias names not been polis 500 years earlier, but I would warn against assuming, as some scholars have, that any substantial archaeological settlement in Messenia or any named community was clearly a perioikic community or clearly a polis in classical times. That adverb clearly does occur in scholarship about such settlements and names. 
Next, as a thought experiment, I thought I would try to estimate the approximate extent of the Chura polis territory of each of these periodic polis. I'm encouraged to do so by Richard Catling's innovative map in the Laconia survey, volume one. Remember, Sparta is a polis and its Chura is only the territory owned directly by the polis of Sparta. So not the whole of Laconia. The rest of Laconia was divided between the Chorai of many dependent periodic polis. We don't have direct evidence from where those boundaries were in the classical period, but Richard did a great job here in estimating on the basis of topography and the location of main settlements where those polis territories might have been. And you'll see also I've added, well, obviously the names in red to make them clearer, but I've also added Thalami and Cardamile, um, which uh, we regard as part of the region of Messenia. Here is a schematic indication of what might have been the Hurai landscapes, territories of the Messenian polis, simply divided with slightly arbitrary black lines. Occasionally, I've taken account of a valley or a river. If this is in any way close to reality, it seems evident that while Kiparisos in the northwest and Mothone in the southwest each had a very large Hura, the rest had notably small territories. And in most cases, extremely limited lowland agricultural territory. We may suppose that they combined a fishing economy, trade, small scale agriculture, and of course, their military role within the Lacedaemonian ethnos or nation, the ethnic unity uh, that united all of the Lacedaemonioi, Spartans and others. Here, however, I've added a few extra names where places may have been polis in the classical period. Again, this is only approximate. I haven't attempted to adjust the Chora boundaries, it would be rather complicated. I merely note that several of them would become even smaller if we add in extra polis. Indeed, some of these possible polis would be extremely close together, closer than I think any we know about in Laconia, suggesting a different kind of relationship and possibly a different kind of role for these small polis communities, if that's what they were. In addition, uh, this would imply, though we don't have uh, any kind of exact figure, it would imply that each of them supplied rather fewer soldiers to the Lacedaemonian army than would otherwise be the case. There's an obvious question whether the territories of the more northerly polis extended into the agricultural heartland, the area in green, the Steady Claros and the Southern Plain. Uh, for example, you might have, Thuria might have had a, a Chora that before the creation of Ithome, Mesene, it might have had a Chora that extended as far as the boundary with the Chora of Kiparisos, in which case they both had huge Chora. I'm inclined to say not. <coughs> I'm inclined to see the farmed lowlands of central Messenia as a specially organised area. Bill Kavanagh has recently suggested that late Bronze Age settlement traditions may be preserved in the distribution of the Messenian periodic polis of the historic period. Furthermore, Davis and Stocker argue that memories of the Bronze Age were strongest in the Pylos area on, in the center west, the center of the former Mycenaean kingdom, and weaker in the further province, as it's called in the Linear B tablets, which was centered around Thuria in east central Messenia. Memories were also, they suggest, weaker in the Pamisos Valley as a whole, including the Steniklaros Plain. Oddly, Pylos itself, or Corifacion, as the Lacedaemonians seem to have called it, may not have been a periodic town in classical times. Thucydides says that in 425 BC, both it and much of the surrounding land were uninhabited. The Minnesota survey, as we shall see later, found several classical sites in the vicinity. If any of those was a nucleated settlement, it evidently was not a periodic polis in 425 BC. Why there was no periodic polis at this naturally strategic and eminently defensible location is very hard to explain. It leaves a gap of over 30 miles, 50 kilometers, between Mothone in the south and Kiparisos in the north. Perhaps Pylos did become a polis after the liberation of Messenia in 369, but the archaeological evidence is so far inconclusive. Whether the catalogue of periodic polis is in any way accurate matters less 
and the fact that almost all of them are on the coast. Another obvious feature is the preponderance of polis around the Messenian Gulf in, and in the southeast, called Asinaios or Coronaios Sinus on the map. This may reflect uh, the impositions dictated by Spartan strategy, but given the probable antiquity of these places, we should distinguish the fact of a town's existence, which might have Bronze Age origins, from the possibility that it was organized as a polis dependent upon Sparta, which may possibly be the result of Spartan policy, or at least a tolerance of the status quo. The third striking feature is the absence of polis in the central lowlands, as I've already indicated, unless we extend the Choras to meet each other. That's up to the time of the foundation of the Thome in 369. So how was this agricultural heartland organized if there were no polis in it? In the history and archaeology of classical Messenia, what I call horizontal divisions, like the layers in a sponge cake, are easier to see than vertical ones, the divisions of the Earth's surface that I mentioned earlier. We know rather more about the largest social class in this region, the Helots, than we do about the Perioikoi. The Helots, Helotai or Helotes, were Sparta's largest groups of sub group of subjects, and they were subjected in a different sense from the Perioikoi. Besides their large numbers in Messenia, there were some we know in Laconia. These people are not Lacedaemonians. An ancient writer says they are between free and slave, but in modern terms, we must assign them to the class of slaves, since con consonant with modern conventions, any or some of the rights of ownership were exercised over them. So in modern terms, that makes them slaves. The fourth century BC writer Ephorus, as paraphrased by the geographer Strabo, says that they could be bought and sold, but only within the borders, which it surely means within Laconike, Laconia plus Messenia and probably implies that they could only be sold between their owners, Spartans, and perhaps Perioikoi, and could not be sold to others. In other respects as well, the helot system differed from typical Greek slavery. Helots had not been bought in the slave markets of the Aegean world, or captured recently in war. But they may have been formally categorized by the Spartans as war captives, and the descendants of war captives, of rebels against Spartan rule long ago in the early archaic period. A legal fiction, perhaps, which could have been used to justify imposing unending penalties upon them for their disobedience. The penalty, as Tertaios says, as early as the seventh century, see the slide, surrendering half of the produce of their land to the Spartan, Spartans, the Spartiates. Helots are thus plausibly defined by Stephen Hodkinson in his fundamental study of Spartan society as sharecroppers. In the Messenian heartland, there is possible evidence, which I haven't time to go into, that they may have had promoted helots as their own overseers. It seems now to be generally accepted, as I think it was not a generation ago, that the helots were not a rootless, servile slave population even a population of slave gangs living in constant fear of displacement, lacking any family life in the way that many slaves in Greece were. Rather, they were tied to, probably to particular estates and farms, unless they were, perhaps on occasion, sold to other Spartans or Perioikoi. And they had a family structure that was reproduced through the generations. The Scottish philosopher David Hume in the 18th century made a similar observation, as you can see. He cites the same passage of Ephorus, paraphrased by Strabo, and presumably has in mind the words, having assigned to them certain <coughs> settlements to live in. We can't do much more than that with Ephorus and Strabo. The archaeology and the nature of the landscape are a better guide, I think. The limited archaeological survey data suggest that there was not a dense scatter of small rural sites in the agricultural heartland of Messenia. There are just six or eight sites there. The square is classical, the hexagon, which is the MME's choice of symbol, uh, marks Hellenistic. And you can see perhaps half a dozen uh, or eight sites or so in that whole lowland area. That, of course, was non-intensive survey. 
But scholars seem to agree that the evidence favours or tends to suggest that there was not <clears throat> a dense scatter of isolated farmsteads. Rather, the data are consistent with primarily nucleated, those small settlements, as implied by this map from the Laconia survey, the Minnesota survey's uh, end papers. Indeed, as we may note, there are several, three or four, in the region of Pylos, as I discussed earlier, inconclusively. Less plausible, I think, is the suggestion that Helots occupied two classical houses excavated in the Sulimar Valley. Uh, Sulimar is now called Ano Zorio. It seems probable that the courtyard house, uh, illustrated from Katsas's plan here, dates to about 450 to 425 BC, uh, later than the excavators originally dated it. But apart from evidence of domestic production in the house, such as loom weights, the archaeology does not show who lived in the house. The same goes for an apparently contemporary building at, uh, near the village of Vasiliko, uh, a few miles to the east, possibly early 5th century. Both of these, however, are really at the northern limit of Messenia. Vasiliko is just on the edge of the lowland territory, so cannot necessarily be regarded as indicative of the settlement pattern in the heartland of the farming area. Assuming Spartans were not resident in these establishments, for they were obliged to live in Sparta nearly all the time for purposes of military and civic life, we cannot know whether the owners of these two houses were prosperous perioikoi or conceivably superior promoted helots, such as those whom Hodkinson thinks were probably put in charge of other helots in the fields. It seems hard to imagine that the Spartans, when they took control of the region, found it necessary to demolish and evacuate long established villages. After all, it would be easier to keep a close eye on the conquered population, perhaps through bailiffs and managers. Uh, indeed, uh, they would have been anxious if they regarded the helots as rebels and war captives and even criminals in that sense. Uh, they would have been anxious, I think, to maintain a close watch, rather than seeing them scattered across the landscape in small farmsteads, as some have supposed. Blank slide is deliberate. Uh, uh, there will be one slide later. It seems Helot society was in many ways a typical Greek Hellenic society, with families persisting through generations on the same site, unless interrupted by some cause, such as death in battle, or perhaps occasionally by being lynched by young Spartan warriors in the notorious coming of age ritual, the Crypteia, or secrecy. I cannot, however, imagine that large numbers were murdered in that way. Ruling classes often persuade themselves that it takes only a few acts of terror to cow a population, even though the long-term effect is often quite the opposite. Despite all this, and other forms of oppression that the Spartans exercised, mockery and so on, getting them drunk according to the sources and things like that. Despite all that, it seems to me possible that the helots, to some extent, may have internalized the value of the, the values of the Lacedaemonian system, at least to the extent that when they were mobilized as part of a Spartan-led army when on campaign, they could apparently be relied upon. Occasionally, they were offered their freedom in wartime. The question of Helot identity became political in the 5th century. It appears that both the Spartans and, more surprisingly, the Thebans, <coughs> who had conquered the region in the 360s, refused to recognize the non perioikic inhabitants of Messenia as Messenians. Instead, it was denied by both parties that Helots were Messenians, rather they were simply former Spartan slaves. It was alleged that the old Messenians had left en masse after the Spartan conquest, 300 years before, supposedly. Luraga believes that Messenian identity split off from Lacedaemonian identity, since there was initially no significant difference between the material culture of the two regions. But as Jonathan Hall points out, material culture need not vary with ethnic identity. And Hall prefers to see Messenian identity as something formulated and led <clears throat> by what we may call the Messenian diaspora, 
outside the Peloponnese. We possess so many place names that can't be linked to specific sites, archaeological remains that is, that it seems likely that they surely include the names of Helop settlements. As already noted, it's likely that many of those existed long before the Spartans conquered Messenia. For my purposes, the key notion is that helots in Messenia were held in a pre-political condition, unable to form polis or city-states of their own. They may have had towns, the towns may even have been regarded as, rural, uh, as having rural territories, but they had no Greek-style politics, which you will remember is the third requirement <coughs> of Hansen's observed regularity in the use of the word polis in the sources down to the end of the classical period. Lurage is <clears throat> probably right to suppose that the number of incomers who joined in setting up the new polis of Ithome, later Messini, was relatively limited. Some disaffected Lacedaemonian perioikoi from Laconia, some from Messenia, some run runaway helots from Laconia, probably a modest number of returnees or their descendants from the Messenian diaspora, who, if Paul is right, were the ones really pushing the idea of a Messenian identity. Which polis would freed helots and others join? Well, naturally, the new one, the new Ithome. Likewise, disaffected perioikoi, if any, from the Lacedaemonian towns in Messenia would surely not stay where their, where their new privileges would not be welcome or not guaranteed. What was the size of the new polis? It is surely worth remembering that in the early classical period, as Herodotus reports of the Battle of Plataea in 479, helots supporting the Lacedaemonian army outnumbered their masters several times over. He says seven. We don't have to believe that it was seven, but he wouldn't have made that statement if it wasn't several. Surely this large helot population was largely resident in the agri agricultural heartland of the region and now formed the core of the new citizens of Ithome. Imagine the situation in 369, a population of maybe 20, 30, 40,000 newly freed villagers, let's call them that, mostly in and around the Pamisos Valley, suddenly doubling their income, remember, no longer surrendering half their crops, if they could find a market for their surplus, were taken into a newly created polis, which thereby was far larger than any in Laconia or Messenia. No wonder the Thebans, as part of their scheme of fencing in Sparta with the three M's, as I call them, the new cities of Messini and Megalopolis in Western Arcadia, the refounded city of Mantinea in Eastern Arcadia, took the initiative as well in creating what Pausanias calls the finest fortifications in the Greek world. No wonder the city went on to build some of the finest and most elaborate public edifices in Greece during the late 4th and 3rd centuries and onwards. Doubtless the city remained prosperous, and the former helots, many of them newly enriched, may have paid much of the cost of these buildings. No wonder, too, that the polis of Ithome, then Messini, became the dominant force in the new regional community of this area. Unsurprisingly, the distribution of inscriptions indicates that the whole region was very strongly centralised upon Messini. No wonder, too, as Luragi points out, the adjectival form Messenia for its territory became the habitual term for a wider area, the whole region. Perhaps we can also see here, as my colleague Dr Richard Evans pointed out to me last week, the origins of an habitual caution on the part of the Messenians in their dealings with other Peloponnesian states in the late 4th and 3rd centuries, almost to the point of isolationism. Also, the origin of the greed shown by outsiders such as the megalopolitan leaders of the Achaean League in the second half of the 3rd century, their desire to bring their, this rich city into their web, a rich and prosperous city which uniquely among the polis of the Peloponnese, caused Polybius to describe it as oligarchic, referring to the late third century. This would be consistent with the increased size of rural estates that seems implied by the Minnesota survey data. 
Recently, elsewhere, I argued that the elite of this polis, Messini, as of others in the Peloponnese, developed new and active trading interests in the early Hellenistic period, which explain the frequency of building activity. Quite separately, ceramic specialists have identified an insular character to the styles of early Hellenistic pottery from Messenia, even a cultural conservatism in that respect. So it's remarkable that several different indicators point in the same direction. And this is the view of several archaeologists and historians writing recently. Themelis, for example, quotes Rizakis and Turatsoglu, who identify Messenian political culture as timocratic, that is, wealth dominated, and their attitude as one of deliberate seclusion. Although we tend to imagine a binary opposition between Messenian and Lacedaemonian identity, the latter was not monolithic. Pausanias attests to contested ethnicities and namings, both in his own time and before. Abia was originally Ire, and Thea became Thuria. Ipeia was Homer's Aipu and was renamed Corone, but ought to have been renamed Coronea and was named by mistake. The people of Colonides were from Attica, but those of Mothone, originally named Pedasos, were from Nauplia in the Argolid, and those of Asine were from at the other Asine in the Argolid. However, they maintained an identity as Dryopians, referring to a legendary early people of Greece. Lirarchy suggests, surely rightly, that the people of Asine were seeking to differentiate themselves from others other communities in Messenia, and something like that may lie between some of the other elisions and ambiguities. So we start potentially to see cracks in the facade of Lacedaemonian ethnic identity among the Perioikoi of Messenia and their descendants. And perhaps that is to be expected when the former Perioikoi of the Lacedaemonian ethnos were now hugely outnumbered by their neighbours in a powerful non lacedaemonian city-state, Messini, with the power to bend the whole region to its will. The former Perioikic polis cannot have done well out of 369. If, on the one hand, they possessed helots, or if their hura extended into the agricultural heartland, clearly their incomes were savaged at a stroke. Alternatively, if the region became a federation, as is possible but not certain, they were surely dominated by the very much larger city of Messene. Some signs of resistance are visible. The Arcadians in 365 stroke four had to use force to overcome Corifacion, which by now was perhaps a polis at Pylos, and also the polis of Kiparisos in the Northwest. Kiparisos, however, may have become firmly loyal to the new state of things, for it withstood a Spartan invasion after 220. As always in Greek history, such changes of loyalty really, I think, reflect uh, internal changes in the makeup and allegiance and opinions of groups within a citizen body. It's not the case that a polis has a brain and decides today I am Lacedaemonian. People, the centre the center of the voting population perhaps, may swing another way and create a majority for a different allegiance. There is a suggestion that the Thebans in the 360s built a new harbour for Kiparissos. That would make sense if the ports of southern Messenia were still in Spartan hands. The forces of fragmentation were ever present, and the incorporation of the fringe polis of Messenia into the Achaean League eventually encouraged their splitting from Messenia. As Catherine Grandjean has observed from a study of the coinage, I end with some very undeveloped geographical questions prompted by reading Yi Fu Juan, the geographer from Minnesota. Community identities require continual maintenance and must evolve and adapt in order to persist. In Greece, polis and regional identities were often fostered by alleged, if often fictive, kinship, descendant from a legendary hero, for example, or from original settlers, perhaps arriving supposedly with the consent of the existing inhabitants. In reality, the underpinning of such identity, as in many modern nation states, is less about genuine 
kinship, and more often about coexistence in a shared territory which you are prepared, prepared to defend and which you have responsibility for managing. In such a situation, your shared land accrues meanings <coughs> over time. The Lacedaemonian Perioikoi of Messenia had their land and their cult places. The Helots had theirs. We tend perhaps to suppose that the Helots in the heartland before 369 lacked the means to endow their villages and fields, their hills and streams with names and meanings and history. But a moment's reflection suggests that this is highly unlikely, especially if the population was ancient and settled. It certainly had a conscious heritage of deities, Olympian and local, and of course, responsibility for their fields. Madalena Tsunino has been thought over optimistic in linking post-liberation Messenian cults to the late Bronze Age and intervening sanctuaries. A moment's intervention from the software. Thank you. People have doubted that Sunino is right to say that Messenian religion very often has very deep roots in the late Bronze Age. Uh, I'm not sure they're right. Uh, in the light of what now seems a reasonable understanding of Messenian settlement, the antiquity and continuity of much cult practice can hardly be doubted. It is certain, for example, to name just one case that the key cult site of northern Messenia, the Amdanian Mysteries, has an archaeological beginning in the 8th century at least. Two Anne comments that places acquire meaning and that a place is a pause in movement. A salient feature of the maps was the gap in central Messenia around the future polis of Messini. We must assume, however, that even before 369, this central agricultural land was a place, not a space. And it was so perhaps for both the Lacedaemonian Perioikoi and the Helots. The vacuum we tend to imagine, or at least we introduced by not thinking about this question, the vacuum at the heart of Messenia was not cultural, it was political. Mountains can give a focus to a landscape. The peak of Mount Taygetos on the boundary between Laconia and Messenia, visible from all over central Laconia, as we learned in our seven, I think, summers in, on the Laconia survey in the 1980s, is an ever present sign, as well as a locator. The same must have been true on a smaller scale in Messenia for Mount Ithome, even at only 2,500 feet high, 800 meters for it has a view to the sea. It may have been endowed with qualities of subordination to the much higher Taigetos, or it may have been seen as an emblem of resistance. For Perioikoi and even at times for the ruled Helots, it might be a reminder of their political affiliation to the Lacedaemonian system. In terms of Tuan's geographical terminology, it was a place, surely, and was endowed with meaning and memories of actions. It was, of course, the site of the ancient cult site of Zeus Ithomatas. Recently, Hamish Williams on Odyssey 912 and Christina Williamson and Adam Wisnura on Asia Minor have shown in their different ways that mountains are ambivalent, but often central to cultures as storied places. James Roy has explored how the Arcadians learned to live with the mountains that loomed over them from the north. And these themes seem worth pursuing further. Not now. At a key point on his journey, Pausanias links the road from Thuria in the southeast towards Arcadia northwards with the springs of Pamisos, the main river of Messenia where he says, little children find cures. Tuan notes the importance to communities of identifying their river and how it gives identity and life to their land. We're familiar with other examples, the Tiber, the Thames, the Seine, the Vultava. Immediately comes the turning to, the road turning, or Senyas takes, to Messene, under Mount Ithome with its twin peaks. He endows the second peak, Eva, with a legendary glitter, attributing its name to the fact that the Bacchic cry of Evoi, 
was first uttered here by Dionysus and his attendant women. Not merely will the meanings of mountain and plain have changed after 369, they were always ambivalent and multivalent, surely. As Tuan writes, while it takes time to form an attachment to place, the quality and intensity of experience matters more than simple duration, end of quote. Perhaps by Pausanias's day, when the Peloponnesian regions were no longer politically powerful, the effort of maintaining and renewing became conscious and self-conscious. Tuan again, quote, to the extent that the effort is conscious, it is the mind at work, and the mind, if allowed its imperial sway, will annul the past by making it all present knowledge, end of quote. So can we look back to a more, if you like, organic period when meanings were unexamined, but ambivalent and multivalent. Equally ambivalent are planes, a symbol of opportunity and freedom sometimes, or alternatively, depressing in their endlessness. Spaces, Tuan says, are open, pointing to the future, inviting action and change. However, I've suggested that planes can also be places or contain places. These are questions, again, that would be interesting to think about on the basis that the Helot population was not decultured. For the Helot slaves, the scene of their servitude might be symbolized by the plains of Messenia. They're laboring for the gain of others. Yet it was also a field of care in Tuan's terms, for they farmed it probably generation after generation. And their family's income, such as it was, depended on their long-term practices. They maintained the land that had long been theirs and was potentially perhaps the carrier of hope for a better future. Roads, routes, as I explored in another publication, work at different scales, rather like the motorways, A roads, B roads, and unclassified roads and lanes of England today. The Minnesota surveyors devoted considerable effort to reconstructing the internal communications of Bronze Age Messenia, and this might be attempted for later periods, starting perhaps from Pausanias's text. Movement along roads generates associations and memory. Just as the fitful presence of Macedonian power in the Peloponnese in the third century cannot have erased the meanings of places, so the presence of Spartans or their agents in Stelikaros, brutal as it may have been at certain times, was probably powerless to inscribe a new history on the experienced landscape of the inhabitants. The Helots themselves were present much more in those fields than anyone else. We might explore how Pausanias refers to Rhodes on his winding tour of Messenia from the Laconian frontier via Thuria to Messini, down again to the sea and round the coast to the river Neda, the border with Elis. He takes Rhodes as a given and unfortunately does not endow them so richly with sacred spots as he does in his book on Laconia, book three. The reason is that his first 29 chapters in book four are his main purpose to demonstrate, as he says, quote, the many sufferings of the Messenians, how fate scattered them to the ends of the earth, far from Peloponnese, and afterwards brought them safely home to their own country, unquote. In actual fact, on current views, most of the population had not left, and only a small proportion of the diaspora returned, if Liragi is right. Rather then, if we think about Messenian landscapes, it allows us to reimagine the roads both before and after liberation as continually made meaningful and remade by their own folk. To conclude, ironically, in the decades before Roman power came to preside wholly over southern Greece, both Messenia and Sparta were out on a limb, holding out against Macedonia and its ally, the Achaean League. The renowned poet Alcaios of Messene, active in the years around 200 BC, pulled no punches in his scorn for the brutal invader Philip V of Macedonia. Could he have written these lines if he had not come from a community that was determined to go its own way, that was confident in its identity as a place, post-liberation Messene? Thessalias Trisai Kemetha Muriades Emathia Megapema. 
Tod de thrasu keino Filippu pneuma thoon elaphon ochet elaphrotero. Savage, sarcasm at the puny Macedonian ruler who had been defeated by the Romans. And there I conclude. So if you have been, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Brent. That's really, really thought provoking and very comprehensive survey of the Messenian situation. Uh, can I... Okay, can I... Uh, can I remind people of uh, what I what was said at the beginning? This is for the people listening online. That uh, please, can we have questions in the double speech bubble uh, icon, which has got the, the queue at it, and uh, no questions in the chat feature? Please, does anyone in the room here have a question? Yes, possibly. Yes. yes. Do we have any feeling at all for the relative sizes of the populations of uh, actual Spartans and the Perioiki and Helots? Uh, it's very fragmentary. Um, at the Battle of Thermopylae, is it? What is it? Seven, two, three, four. I don't usually remember references like that. Um, <laughs> Herodotus makes the exiled Spartan king Demaratos say to King Xerxes, um, because Xerxes asks him about what is Sparta, and he says, well, Sparta is a city in Lacedaemon, which is an interesting phrase, um, and there are 8,000 Spartans, 5,000 of whom were here, and uh, their equal number of other Lacedaemonians were here, and they are good but not quite similar to the Spartans. Homoioi, which may, I think, be a play on the word homoios, which is what the Spartans called themselves, the similars, not equals, the similars. Um, so that's the two thirds levy of the Spartans. Perhaps we have two thirds levy of the Perioikoi. That might suggest that there were 16,000 available soldiers in total, half Spartan, half Lacedaemonian. That's as far as one can go, other than the reference to Plataea later in Herodotus. I'm afraid I can't remember the chapter number. Whereas I quoted, uh, he says there are seven helots to each Spartiates. Seven would be represented in a medieval manuscript by a single letter, or can easily be misread as another letter. But Herodotus wouldn't have said something like that if it hadn't been several, I think. So we'd say several helots per Spartan at Plataea. I forget how many Spartans were at Plataea or whether we know. That's, a, a, that's all I know, I think, um, for the classical period. Does that help? Yeah, well, I, I, as much I, as we're going to find out, yes. I mean, I think it's possible that Carl Julius Beloch did this 140 years ago. I haven't checked the Bevölkerung der Griechischen Welt. He probably did go and work out what the probable hoplite contingent from each periodic polis was. But he may have had a different view of which the polis were. Suffice to say that if there are about 10 or more in Messenia, and I forget the numbers, about 30 or so, or more in Laconia, you've got 40 or more, divide 8,000 by that, you might have only 200 from each polis on average. And some of them were probably very much larger than others, therefore some would be smaller. That's just kind of ballpark thinking, but I think it's interesting to, to speculate. I've always assumed that the periorchic polis, because they are recognized in the sources as polis, must have had some sort of internal structure. Greek style politics, not democratic, probably more like oligarchy or aristocracy or whatever, and must have organized some part of their own military training. You might have said enough. Okay, I, I've got a question here for you from David Blackman, who first of all says it's a fascinating lecture and he wants to mention two early groups of Messenians those who went to Navpaktos mm -hmm. and he says did they go back after Aegis and those who went to Zankel 
And he says, I presume they stayed in what became Messini? I can't claim any expertise on this. I have only uh, can only direct people to Luragi's book. Um, I think it's called The Ancient Messenians, 2008, which I consulted last week. So now Pactos, under the sponsorship of the Athenians, that's on the north side of the Corinthian Gulf, the Athenians in the late fifth century encouraged runaways from this region, Messenia, if we call it that, to settle at now Pactos. And I think Jonathan Hall thinks that that was part of the focus for the development of a Messenian identity in exile, sort of Messenia in waiting, as it were. Zancle in Sicily, is it, or is it opposite, opposite Sicily, is now Messana, and it changed its name very early after its foundation, um, and is the subject of a whole chapter in Viraghi's book, which I haven't read in detail, at least not this week. Um, and he has a very astute discussion which concludes that uh, only a small proportion of that Messenian diaspora with a possibly slightly created identity would have re-migrated back into the homeland. But I, I have nothing to offer that's original uh, or any command of primary evidence, I'm afraid. Thank you. That's, so here is uh, a question from Florentia Frankopoulou. Thank you for the marvellous talk. Could you please elaborate a bit more by giving some examples on how the helots internalized the Lacedaemonian ways, if I understood the, correctly the term you used? Pure supposition. Um, I speculated in an early publication on this, something that arose out of the Laconia survey, just a priori, really. There's a, of course, there is, it is possible to construct a quite different view, which is that the helots were brutalized um, and totally unfree and merely the victims. It's possible to argue that just the fact that several went out with every Spartan on campaign doesn't mean that they were reliable. So people have often suggested that the, the Helots families back home were kind of hostages uh, for their loyalty. Um, I do think there's a, an alternative view to that. And the, I suppose in the light of what I've been thinking about in the last couple of weeks, um, one reason for that is the way the landscape has to have worked. The Spartans wanted reliable cultivators. They want half the produce of Steniklaros and Panasos Valley. Um, they're not going to be breaking heads all the time. Um, the Helots, as David Hume suspected in the 18th century, probably were, you know, a settled population, as he said, reproducing their race through time or something like that. Um, in order for that to be the case, there has to have been a certain amount of compliance, it seems to me. I don't think they can have been a brutalized population under the whip at all times. Yes, there were acts of terrorism. So Florentia, it's great that you were able to watch the talk. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any primary evidence that comes to mind. Only a priori, uh, or a fortiori, perhaps a supposition. Okay, thank you for that answer. And here's a, a question from Susan DC. I loved what you said about space and place and cult. Is much known about sanctuaries in the countryside of Messenia? Yes, a great deal, uh, but not, I'm not expert at all on that. The classic text I mentioned is by Maddalena Tsunino, I think 1999, which was her, uh, her PhD thesis enlarged. Um, and uh, I think the reviewers felt that they were being quite kind by saying she's a, a bit overbold in seeking to push back the origins of Messenian cults, which of course are standard Olympian cults, um, back into the geometric period or the late Bronze Age. Um, but her book is terribly useful, the reviewers tended to say. I think it's more than that, you know, I think it's really a game changer in a sense. I think Robert Parker said something very positive about it in a review, if I'm not misquoting him. Um, that Sunino's work did show, you know, some degree of continuity um, in religious practice, as, especially, of course, we're reliant on post-369 writings for the names of cults and things like that. But there's an awful lot of cults uh, across Messenia. I'm not really expert in it, but um, there's, a, there's, there's good material there, Susan. <laughs> okay, 
Thank you. So I, I think that's all the, all the questions. And I hope that everyone who's, the very many people who listened in online on this lecture, um, if you enjoyed the lecture and if you would like to contribute to the, the Friends Fund, which supports research at the BSA, we'd be very grateful. And um, I think you have the link from when you signed up for this lecture. And please remember to write friends in the information box. And it just remains to thank Graham formally again for such a really great lecture. And we look forward to visiting many of these places in April. Thank you. Thank you.